guys. Uh, we have with us tonight uh, Jimmy Lee Tillman II. Uh, uh, he will tell us about uh, the uh, Martin Luther King Republicans. Uh, and uh, why uh, he wants to uh, dump the Democratic Party and uh, why he is a candidate. Republican. <laughs> but he'll tell us all about it. Uh, so, without further ado, we will hear from our main speaker tonight. No, I want more ado. Oh, yes, well, ado, ado, ado. Uh, here, uh, Jimmy Lee Tillman II. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I apologize for being late. Everything went wrong. Lakeshore Drive, we got off at Lawrence, got caught behind a funeral procession. Huh. Every street, every corner, every corner, every street. Because this is like my first um, speech as um, a candidate. But um, for those who don't know, my name is Jimmy Lee Tillman II. Again, like he said, I'm running for U.S. House Representatives of the 1st Congressional District. But I'm not here to talk about politics because um, I don't think none of you all are in my area. But I appreciate this time. What I am here to discuss is the image of the black American, excuse me, in the age of Obama. Now, when I first researched the college complex, I saw all the wonderful speakers that you had here. Some speakers reminded me of my... Appreciate that, thank you. Some, yes, here we go. I appreciate that, I'm sorry. Um, some of the speakers remind me of the people I hear on um, Coast to Coast at night, so I didn't know how can I, um, <laughs> how can I cater my um, speech to you all. So I decided to hit something that was probably close to home right now, and it's the image of the black American <clears throat> in this age of Obama. So I thought long and hard of it. I did a couple of um, shows on my radio program, Jimmy, Jimmy Lee's Underground Radio Network on Blog Talk Radio, Monday through Thursday. Thursday through hip hop, but Monday through Wednesday, open forum on all type of political discussions. You know, you might have your art bell tight, your everyone's on there, welcome. But anyway, the topic was how are black Americans perceived now that we have a black president. Now, I'm saying um, black American not being politically correct because you can be a white African American, but some specifically speaking to the descendants of slaves that are here in America. Back in the 80s, if some of you all was young enough to remember the 80s, there was um, a president, there's a president by the name of, um, there's a president election in the 80s by 84 with Jesse Jackson. Now Jesse Jackson ran for president and that was like so revolutionary. Now the reason why it was revolutionary, not because Jesse Jackson ran, because we had Shirley Chisholm, we had other black candidates before, but why Jesse Jackson's election was so revolutionary was that it allowed black America to see that the Democratic Party was allowing blacks to um, progress in their ranks. So it gave everybody a good feeling, run, Jesse, run. I mean, everybody was behind him. run, run. His election was so powerful that it forced the Democratic Party to divvy up their um, electors differently to allow other minorities to get in it. So that even opened the door a little bit wider. So more blacks feel more enthused. Four years later, we and Jesse win. So we feel that this time they open the door, it might be a chance for him to get on and win. But he bowed out. He um, decided to get out and take a secondary position, I think, um, Mondale's vice presidency ship. At that time, he could have beat Mondale, but he took a time out. A lot of black people in the community felt disappointed because they felt at that time he could have had a chance. So he held our breaths, thinking that in 92, you got it. But again, he stepped back and allowed Clinton to get to it. So all we was left with keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Later on, we got Barack Obama. Now, most people say Barack Obama stands on the shoulder of Harold Washington, given the movement and the order of people who we gather around in this camp. But you can really look at Barack Obama standing on the shoulders of Jesse Jackson, i.e. 
showing the democratic electric, meaning the foot soldiers and the workers who vote for them time and time again that we care and we are brave enough to elect you. Now, when Barack Obama made his announcement on the steps of the Illinois Capitol, I sat there with my son. I am Republican for the record, you know, and I did vote for Obama, just for the record. I ain't, you know, I'm Republican, so don't let it get all twisted. So I sat there with my son, and um, he made his announcement. And chills went to, through me. Now, I'm not saying he's a messiah or some spiritual person, but chills went through me. And my son looked at me and was like, Daddy, why are you feeling this way? Well, I said, well, son, every parent tells his child that you can be anything in the world. But every parent knows that they're lying to their child. So this time, what this man is doing, my son, is making me not a liar. He's proving me to be truthful. So in the spirit of that, I had to show my son the power of what we can do. Now, not all blacks were behind Barack Obama. You want to hear them say, yeah, we was behind 100%, but if you rewind history, you see majority of them was with Hillary Clinton because they didn't believe at the time that he had a chance. You trace it all the way back to the New Hampshire election. But some people say Hillary Clinton stole it. Dennis Kucinich had a case about it that he took it. But it was an iron my shirt debate. Iron my shirt, iron my shirt. Well, Hillary Clinton finally got her voice back when all of the sexist remarks was coming at her. But in that defeat that Hillary Clinton handled Barack Obama, it allowed him to stand in front of everybody being defeated and coming up with the greatest... I'm sorry. I apologize, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, gave um, one of the greatest speech was, yes we can. And the reason why the Yes We Can speech was so um, prevalent was because it showed someone being defeated and not letting defeat overtake them. And that speech alone is what the speech that really galvanized all the African Americans behind Barack Obama, because at that time, it was split down the line 50-50. So now we have elected the first black president. Now prior to Barack Obama being party, and was like, well, the Tea Party, they're racist. Oh, look at how they talk to Obama, oh, they're racist. I'm not gonna defend the Tea Party because yes, there are racist aspects of the Tea Party. There are racist people in the Republican Party. There are racist people in the Democratic Party. Racism is racism across the board. But most people normally point to racism when it comes to the Tea Party by saying that, well, they say he's not our president, he's not one of us. Now, even though that might hit if you're black in the gut by them saying that he's not one of us, but a couple of years ago, moveon.org and everybody was saying, well, George Bush, he's not one of us. You know, he, he's not one of us. He's not one of us. The same thing was said over and over again. But it's just how the picture's been framed. Now, I don't know what the future holds, but my campaign that I'm running for is to address some of these issues right here in the age of the black man and Obama. Whether you agree with the Voting Rights Act or the Affirmative Rights Act, those were acts that blacks bled for, died for, got hung for. But in the age of Obama, we have a silent black caucus who are afraid to speak up and challenge the president for fearing that by not supporting the president that would that would appear that you're giving in to the silent quiet hand of racism that appears that you hear when you hear Donald Sterling even though he didn't say the n-word he just said I'm broken hearted you messing around with somebody they're laughing at me but you can turn that around and make it seem a certain way because given how everything is scoped right now in the age of racism. So, with these three films and with the climate that now is being uh, spread it out, whether it's the Democratic Party that are being silent right now while rights are being taken from 
the people that they claim to be supporting, though even though the Voting Rights Act and the Affirmative Rights Act and all the Civil Rights Act that were passed in the 60s were pushed by Republicans, it's as if now that the new slavery is like the old slavery or the new Jim Crow is like the old Jim Crow and it's like the same old party is pushing the same agenda all over again. And so what I'm saying is, in conclusion, that in the age of a black president, the unseen hand or the seen hand of racism is pushing images of African Americans to make it easy for white Americans to feel comfortable and seeing African Americans being treated a certain way. And while African Americans are being quiet, why white America are treating them a certain way. And in the age that we're now moving into a generation where you have Copian and Secretary General of the United Nations, the most powerful organization in the, in the world, Colin Powell, the face of America, four-star general, Joint Chief Staff, Defense Secretary, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. In these ages of where African Americans are in powerful positions, making key decisions that affect everyone's life. But in this age of Obama, whether you like Obama or not like Obama, they're framing a situation where we not we won't gain equality, even though equality is what we all strive to achieve. And I'll leave it like that. Any questions you'd like to have, I'll take it from the floor. Thank you very much. I distinctly remember a discussion that I had when I was in the early 80s in a, in a college room with a bunch of people. We were discussing racial integration. And they often said, well, what about what? I said, what do you think about this black person and this black person? And they said, oh. Those guys are white blacks. And I've heard that same phrase used many a times that when a black man gets successful, he turns into a white black and is turned away by his own uh, culture. Can you comment, please? What my definition of a white black would be, because I've tossed it around several times. What Sterling had, I'm gonna back to Donald Sterling again. Sterling had questioned Matthew Johnson on what he has done for the African American community. Now, you can say Starbucks, you can say Burger King, theaters, those are great things. But those blacks who achieved great success, great accolades, and are scared to address certain atrocities that have happened happened to blacks. Let me give you an example. Whether what side you were on in the Trayvon Martin incident, if you was Kobe Bryant and for whatever reason you felt how he felt about the situation and you went and said, well I think Trayvon Martin was a thug and need to be shot. Now, a lot of blacks would feel that, why are you trampling on our pain? Why are you making a mockery of Yes. Why are you making a mockery of our suffering? Those we consider uh, white blacks. Oh, I can go back to the Civil Rights Movement where there were those who told King to don't march, hold on, stay back. Those who tend to pretend to assist you while holding you. Al Sharpton. Can we see where y'all might not consider him a white black, but. A lot of blacks might consider him a white black be given how so many issues might come around. And then when it's time for black action, black action never comes around and things tend to tamper down. A white black is not an educated black who thinks he's smarter than everyone because during the civil rights movement and the movement of the 60s, there was normally black university, black colleges, your Morehouses, your Spellmans, your Hamptons, your black intellectual people who really changed America. So when we ran, we rewind history back and look at all the civil rights movement of every where we at right now, 
the ideologies and ideas that we have right now, those all came from the minds of black universities. So black intellectuals do not look upon black intellectuals as white blacks. You look at somebody as white black as someone who feels that he has no need to help his people. Even though he's black, <laughs> they can come around you all and say he's black. And y'all just look at him because he's black. But he would not do nothing for his people. Just to be happy to be around you. Just to get the little scrums off the table. You see, let me give an example. I have a group called the Martin Luther King Republicans. Why? Because the Republican Party probably racist. You know? I, I'm not going to, you know, so I, I believe in Republican principles and values. Martin Luther King was Republican. Most Republicans did a lot for the cause of black Americans. Matter of fact, it's like my heritage, it's my birthright. It's a party that was put together just to free my people. So when I look at the Republican Party, I go to why it was in existence. The rap on the party is a good rap because no, they don't try to reach out. They might get you white blacks that you might call white blacks because those people don't come to the neighborhoods and speak of what's in the neighborhood or try to even come up with policies that might help their neighborhoods given the cause. <laughs> you know, the oldest conservative institution in the African American community is the black church. And when you peel all the layers of any black organization or any black person that has a fear of the creator, you know, you'll find solid core Republican principles. Now, those who can sit around you all and get the phrases and pats and know they don't have the feelings to go back to their neighborhoods, they know they can't because they, they might not articulate the slang that tough or they can't really roll with the flavor because they too much speaking this, that, there, and thus in the king's language and they've forgotten from whence they come from. If that answers your question, I'm sorry if I took it too long. That's fine. Yes, sir. All right, David. Uh, <clears throat> In view of the fact that uh, uh, Kenya is East Africa, and overall, overwhelmingly, the black people in, in this country are descended from West Africans, and considering that uh, uh, East Africa and West Africa have been feuding for Centuries. Uh, for centuries, that's right, thank you. Uh, that, uh, uh, and also looking at Obama having been elected, I don't see that he's done very much for black people. Uh, I kind of get the impression that he really doesn't even like black people. <laughs> well, I don't know if he, you know, don't like, I can't say that, but. Sometimes, just sometimes, imagery does mean a lot to a lot of people. Sometimes image um, inspires hope. Some people can see an image of a crucifix and that can inspire them of the Savior. You know, sometimes imagery, imagery does something for someone whose spirit and soul is lacking. But if you want to go over to Kenya, if you want to go over there, you know, we're looking at China. See, we're looking at, we're looking at, we look at the resources that China right now are grabbing over there in Kenya. We can just, right now we are locked in war with Russia, locked, we about to go to war with China. If we want to really call a spade a spade, China is back in Nigeria, wholeheartedly for the resources. China is doing so much for Nigeria, they schools, they roads, they paths, they paves. It's a difficult tread for us to even rock in Africa. See, that, no one's going to really speak that too tough. We're not going to really talk about how deep China is in Africa. We can talk about all the ineffective movement, why he's not making these moves. These are lightly treaded moves that if our congressmen and senators will really break down the reasons why these moves are not being played. Now I'm not saying Obama should do this in Africa, Obama should do that in Africa. <laughs> I'm questioning the assassination of um, Omar Gaddafi, was that worthy? Works assassination, what was the move for that? You know, you ran on office saying that you was going to pull back troops, but now you're escalating more troops. You see, again, we're on imagery again. It'd be really difficult for a white president to go to Africa and hit drones. Difficult for a white president to go there and try to get resources from Africa. 
So we might be in a 12 year slave mode. We might have four more years with black presence. So America might be getting used to it because if Africa is the next golden mine of resources, we might about to have resources, the next energy boom and energy source, all the mines, my cell phones, everything is over there. And the oil is a thing of the past. We trying to get our, or we trying to get our oil off. We trying to get our resources off. You got Nigeria. You can put three Americas in Nigeria. Now, what's going on in West Africa and East Africa? We can talk about why you sold us. It goes all back to slave trade. You go back to Christianity and Islam. It's all. It's all about religious wars. America is going to have to one day stop engaging in these religious conflicts. Now, what are they going to use these little girls as a pretext to go into Nigeria or the drone strike Nigeria? Or, because I see it might be a Benghazi, it might be a Benghazi. I mean, excuse me, not Benghazi, it might be a Ukraine. Because all we're going to end up doing is probably arming some Nigerian rebels who's going to take on some China rebels. And then we're going to end up having a makeshift war in a time right now we need resources at home. Now, it's not up to Obama to come up and wave a magic wand. I mean, everybody laughed at Ronald Reagan when he signed the Martin Luther King holiday, birthday. A lot of states said no. Look upon it now, it makes the city a great country. People tripped on George Bush when he took Mandela off the terrorist watch list. What you doing? What you doing? You know? Those are the small things presidents can do. It's the Black Caucus. The Congressional Black Caucus. They have the opportunity to push the agenda for the black community in the face of Obama. But yet they're silent. Because they're getting away with not challenging the emperor. We're not challenging Pharaoh and telling him what his people are needing or lacking. And mostly all the urban cities that are led by Democratic mayors. Everyone is suffering. Detroit is closing down. You got Mississippi going under. You got every little Philadelphia going under. You got every little urban city that's headed by blacks being um, destroyed. And now we're going to push the immigration bill. Whether what side are you on it or not. Now you're going to push the immigration bill and all that does. Not only take jobs from African Americans. Which, they, which, which is really intended to do. I'm back on the 12 years of slave thing. Take jobs back from African Americans. And you want to call them low-skilled, minimum-wage jobs? There are a million women in Philadelphia penitentiary system, black and white, who probably cannot get a job out folding a sheet at a motel because now we're going to let the immigrants in. They might have paid their debt to society. They can't get a job sewing something because of an immigration bill. Right now, what side are you on it or not? You know, until America gets solvent, you know, there's things that we should be concentrating on. But ask LGBT if Obama loves them. Ask Hispanic if Obama loves them. Ask the women if Obama loves them. He loves a lot of people. A lot of people have gotten a lot of things in the age of Obama. But we have been on a short stick, you know. If you look at the immigration front and center, you know, Luis Gutierrez all day long, it's been his, it's, it's been his world for the last six years. He's a, you know... And it's been a forefront. The Lily Ledbetter Act. I mean, gay marriage is here now. I mean, I mean, look, 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 look where we at right now. You know, I mean, so there's a lot of people with their agendas that can feel a whole lot happier that he's president than they probably would have felt with, let's say, an evangelical or a Christian conservative person as president. You know, and another thing about Africa, what you're saying about Obama is that it's funny. He needs George Bush to go to Africa. He can't go to Africa without George Bush because of their religious laws and practice. A lot of their country, whether you, I'm not trying to trip on whatever you, you, your sexuality, whatever you, how you want to love, what have you. But the African countries, that's against their religion and their laws and their doctrines on how they existed. And you have a black president telling them you better do this, do this. A lot of African countries are resisting Obama. George Bush, on the other hand, coming from a Christian conservative point of view, aid, money for Africa, uh, malaria, 
um, small things that you don't get credit for, small things that, you know, play big in Africa, you know. It's just that there are much more things that I blame the Black Caucus for doing for Black America than I do for Black Obama. I feel he's getting away with it. He's the first president since... He's the first president since, Reconstruct since Reconstruction that has not addressed the African-American issue of any president in history. You can go back to each president, the African-American, what we're we gonna do with slaves, what we're we'll gonna do with the blacks. We'll, what we're we gonna do we'll, has always been in the history of America until right now. Okay, I don't know if that, I hope that answered your question. Now I don't know if I went too far off. Next question. Yes, John. Yes, uh, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Just in a very short, uh, two, two or three minutes. Could you tell us why you would be a better U.S. House of Representatives uh, official versus Bobby Rush for the your constituents in that district? Oh, uh, that's a that's a layup. That's a layup. <laughs> no, I, I I know um the Reverend Bobby Rush um grew up on the South Side. Matter of fact. When I was in college, I happened to do a report on him in the Black Panther Party because I'm a history major. So I know Bobby Rush. I watched his ascension from alderman to congressman. Uh, he became congressman when Charlie Hayes was ill, decrepit of health, under investigation, and he made a move at that point in time. Right now, Bobby Rush, his wife is ill right now. He's ill. He's not that effective. He's not being effective as he can for his people. Now me, I'm pro-black, 100% up and down. Um, there are laws and issues right now that I feel that the Republican Party being in the majority at this time with a black president that can push forth an agenda. And the only thing I'm saying for everybody in, in my district, in my area, let's play the math, African Americans. I'm being politically correct there. I do say black Americans, but let's play the math, black Americans. In order for us to get anything accomplished, we must have a voice in the majority. The minority can just scream and holler, but this is America and majority always rules. So unless you have a voice bringing forth your issues in the majority, in a party, since Republicans are the majority, in a party that right now are trying a damnness to recruit African Americans. I feel that the agenda of the, the party of the slave freers, the party of the civil rights giver, the party of the vote giver, the party of the emancipator would not resist on my agenda because that's what the party is for. So what I'm trying to do, and I'm having success in doing it, is educate my constituents by showing them in order for us to get something done. Let's try something different for one chance, for one time. 18 months, let's have an 18 month experiment. And let's see, in 18 months can I bring forth an issue that the Democrats haven't said nothing in the last eight, 16 months, 16 years. All right, uh, Charlie Paydock has a question. Yeah, Jimmy, I want you all out of you need a pen? <coughs> Okay. And the no. one issue, sure? above all, for the Black Caucus, are the efforts by the Republican Party at the state level and in the U.S. Congress to disenfranchise the black and Hispanic voters. So, I'm a little curious here how they're working for the benefit of the people when they don't want them to vote. I can say, this is a two-fold question, I can say the Democratic Party here in Illinois right now is working on dis voters disenfranchisement in the African American community. Right now, 17-year-olds have the right to vote. You can be a junior in high school right now and elect your official, but yet, not one get out to vote. Not one let's register these young people to vote. Not one let's get out here and get these people out here because we need these votes. <clears throat> now, voter disenfranchisement does not have to say, you're not going to vote because I'm not going to give you an ID. It can be that I can beat you down mentally where you don't even want to come out and vote, i.e., let's look at the ticket that just passed. Let's look at the election that just placed. Because of you, there is no challenge 
and Illinois in Cook County, this Cook County for the Democratic Party, the electric be like, ah, why should I go out? They got it anyway. My vote ain't gonna count. My vote don't make no difference. Now, with that fever being in the air right now, there's a whole plethora of untapped resources that the quote-unquote Democratic Party here in Cook County always thrives every year. Jesse Jackson, register to vote. Get out the vote. This is the first time I know none of y'all have ever heard that at all. Y'all haven't heard it at all this election. And this is the first election that you can be a junior and vote. You can be a senior next year and vote. That you can vote twice in your high school lifetime for the your mayor, next for your president, without even leaving college. So when I say voter disenfranchisement, I say the Democratic Party by not putting up a primary opponent for their own electorate to give another different idea. You see, well you have 28% of the vote come out now in Cook County and what is this is a Democratic city. So you can't, and all, it was a big Republican voter turnout, so on our side, it wasn't disenfranchisement, but on the Democratic side, the disenfranchisement came because of, I'm beat down, there's nobody there, nobody even hears me, nobody even argues with me, I'm beating a dead stick. Back in the Jim Crow days, a black would say, why go vote? It don't matter anyway, my vote don't count. They don't hear me regardless. And we're right back that right back there in the same way. We can say the Republicans by using an ID card, which every black in America has to walk down the street if they don't want to get locked up. Even today. You see, so there's not one black who ain't gonna cash their check. You know, there's no social security. I mean, that's not that's not walk out the house with an ID. You see. The word voter suppression is to allow, not, I'm not trying to be sound xenophobic, it gives the Democratic Party carte blanche allow Mexicans to come in and vote without being challenged. And here in Chicago, where you can always have dead voters, we can always find mysterious voters, we can always find voters on the road, and you can always just come in without no ID saying that's that person, who that person is, checking that person to make sure that person is illegal. So, you throw out that word disenfranchisement because it sets alarms off in black folks' head because we have a history of that happening to us when no other race in America has that history. So no other race can say that they feel that way because other races have the path to citizenship where they can be, get all those full-fledged rights. Hope I answered that. All right. All right, let's see. Uh, you have a question. Uh, Wayne, you have a question too. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I just want to be specifically talking about Illinois. What? Or because Cook County. Could you repeat this question? Well, well, I was going. I was. I was basically talking about here in Cook County. But if we want to go, if we want to go to Florida again, or Pennsylvania. Well. Well, you, you want to say Ohio, it was, it was, it was, Ohio was probably the thing. Well, people want to say there's long lines and all, there's long lines, and all, but then it's early voting. I mean, I'm saying it's the, the early voting in states. Now, that brings us right back to you. What was the question? That brings us right back to the Voting Rights Act again. Right. That brings us right back to the Voting Rights Act again. Okay. Now, do us a favor and repeat the question because we can't hear him in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. So say it again. Um, he said the question he was said. Um, was I specifically talking about Illinois when I said voter disenfranchisement? And he was naming states like Florida, Pennsylvania, and I said Ohio. Right. So, if you want to go Mexico, you want to go um, as Arizona. I don't know about Pennsylvania, but Ohio was more likely on the machines than more than people going out and voting because Ohio just voted a minute ago this past recent election with not a glitch, not a problem, and no one ever said I've been disenfranchised or got turned around. Matter of fact, there's so many elections that happened a minute ago and there has not been a story about that situation. Now, 
I can't talk about the machines, you know, because I'm from a political family and I think we lost an election because of voter impropriety on the machines. You know, I'm, I'm from a paper ballot type of a person. I believe in the old school one punch, one ballot. I feel that Florida kind of messed it up. I don't believe a computer should take my vote because I, don't, I believe that they can be tampered with, my vote can be altered. You know, but give Florida, because of the punch, because of Florida, now let's go computers because we feel that's more safer than the punch hole ballot. But, no, I, long, if one wants to exercise their right to vote, then they will put up long lines because in where I, my people, well, my people put up just to get that right for the vote. They stood in long lines and stood for those problems. And waiting in long lines was not a problem. If it's a problem, the county, the county should make adjustments for that for their constituents. If they know it's going to be a longer problem, they can extend the hours a little bit longer. They can do. Here in Cook County, if you look at if there's a problem, they, if there's a problem in Cook County, David Orr, make sure it's settled. To each, each state got their own representatives They might not feel like I feel and passion like I feel. So that's why voting is important for people to go out there and make sure if you was in Ohio, I got friends in Ohio, you was in Pennsylvania, like my friends in Pennsylvania, then they will speak the same thing that you will speak. But there was not a lot of black Panthers stopping people from voting that big hoo hoo ha ha. That never really happened. That, to me again, back on the imagery issue like I was saying, Those images before the voting, those images of what you were saying was taking place prior to the Voting Rights Act being stripped down. That was the Supreme Court. But again, vote against, but again, the Supreme Court sent it back down to the Congress saying, fix this and send it back up to us, which has not happened. So it can be amended because if it can be. That goes back, if the Supreme Court said Congress to fix it, and Congress won't fix it, then that's the problem with Congress. Again, that goes to my problem with the Black Congress because it affects the Voting Rights Act of the Black Congress. It should be much more of an issue right now. All right, that goes to my question. Right. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling because it, the Democratic Party in its history, in its inception, was against all those civil rights laws and rules that was passed from Lyndon Johnson, from Eisenhower, from all the civil rights laws in 1965, civil rights acts and Eisenhower, all those bills that was passed. Yes, Lyndon Johnson signed it, but it was, um, it was, it was um, the Republican Congress and Senate. It's always been a Republican idea issue. In history of America, we can go back and look at all the history and documents and look what party fought against slavery, look what party put enacting all the voting rights laws. You can look at Al Gore's vote, you can look at Robert Byrd's vote, we can look at all those sentences that right back then and all these stances that they took about 40 years ago. And so that, that's that same party. The Democratic caucus can't make a move because they belong to the Democratic Party. And the party has never been that fair in its history toward the plight of the African Americans. Again, I went back to the opening door of Jesse Jackson running, which was the biggest thing because it allowed us to believe that the party had changed because they gave him a big shot. Given the 20 years ago that Bill Connor, governor, you know, Democratic Citizens Council, the Democratic White Council, just 15, 20 years ago was telling Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King, no. All of a sudden, 15 years later, they say, okay, we change our minds. That's why that was such a real, a big move. Right. And from that point on, we've been there. I'm sorry. Our next yeah. question is from Wayne Servant. I'm sorry. One Wayne. thing I, I, I can say. Yeah. Loud, please. Uh, you had a lot of, uh, you had a lot of, uh, I don't know, Democrats in the South who were very, who were very anti-black. Don't you feel that, very well. Your question is about the solid South that was like Democrat. Yeah, don't you think the Southern, the Southern people, Southern Democrats are really, you know, 
supporting rapidly? Well, yes, I do. <laughs> um, if you look at this, if you look at the history of the Republican Party, Texas, the Texas, the Texas Republican Party was founded by African Americans. The Mississippi Republican Party was founded. Every Republican Party in the South was founded by African Americans. The Georgia Republican Party. I mean, every Republican Party. So when you say the Southern Democrats, just because at that time in the South they looked at African Americans getting gaining height and prominence in the Republican Party. You know, if you go to if you if you can go to Congress. And read, um, Mr. C-SPAN, you can read uh, the hearings that they had on um, lynchings back in the um, 40s and 50s. The Ku Klux Klan is on record for saying that they are the military ring for the Democratic Party. I mean, that's on record, you know. So I'm not trying to say Democratic Party all Klan or the Republican Party all Klan. All I'm saying, we all, it's all imagery. And the Republican Party does not do a good job of promoting blacks, even though, again, Colin Powell. I mean, you, 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 you don't get an affirmative action job being Joint Chiefs of Staff, being head of the most powerful army in America. You don't get an affirmative action job being National Security Advisor, securing the whole nation. You don't get an affirmative action job being a Secretary of State. Those are well-qualified jobs, and those are promoted by African Americans for the Republican Party, you see. So when it comes, there are good marshals. Well, whether you feel about Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas, I'm just saying, all these, when it came time to promote blacks in prominent positions, Republican Party had no problem putting them there because they felt that they was qualified and not looking at it as a hand up or I'm gonna put you at my right hand. They put them in place as a position to help America grow. Okay, Ben? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go with you said something about reparations. I just wonder uh, how is that case progressing and what are the chances of actually getting a dollar? I mean, I think that it's up to $3 trillion or something. Now, I mean, Jews got some money from Germany. They still get some money for recent World War II, but uh, slavery was a hundred. Jim Crow was about fifty years ago. Yeah, but are you are you trying to get reparations from Jim Crow? No, what I slavery? see, what reparation, see, reparation was is an institution, and it's like, and we can still go on to the institution of back to Sterling again, back to what I'm saying, institutionalized racism. Is this? Let me go ahead and ask the reparations question first. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, it all comes back. Everything comes. Everything comes back to Dollar Sterling right now. I don't know why. Everything comes back to Sterling. I don't know why. <laughs> right. Um, so you want reparations from Sterling? No. <laughs> magic. That's what Magic Johnson wants. No. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know where it's going. The HR 40 bill is not a reparations bill. The HR 40 bill is a study of the effects that slavery had on the descendants of African Americans and America, which started this culture of Jim Crowism, which started, which, which put us in this mindset that we are in right now, which puts us back to the, again, we're back on imagery. When you look at reparations, people look at dollar amounts and cash amounts and land grants. Right now, we are in a different society where the 40 acres and a mule cannot be equally distributed. First of all, you gotta see who are the descendants of African Americans. Descendants of slaves, you're gonna break it down to black Amer African Americans, or you're gonna say descendants of slaves because they're the ones who built this country and then get a dime and got their children ripped around from them and raped them. All you wanna deal in, the lack of education, you want to deal with the opportunity, or you would have done all the all the institutions that you put in place. Therefore, so the African American could not even get equal footing. Now, there are ways. Let me throw just a hypothetical at you. Let's just say 
or Barack Obama said, I'm giving reparations right now, every black American dead clear. You didn't feel nothing. Next day, the economy just boomed real off, off a quick heartbeat because they just spent all their money all, all over again. I'm just saying there, I'm going, to I'm going to retire all your college debt, all every African American with school. Would you keep it down? Um, I am going to give you the same loan opportunities that I give a rap when they come over here for a quick second. Or I'm going to try to give you the same fair tax breaks that I give refugees when they come over here for a second. What I'm saying, you ain't got to look at just a, a dollar amount. What would be equal to clean the slate of what has been done and there's no denying what has been done because again, you saw 12 years of slave, you saw the butler, you saw Django, I mean, it's right in your face. I don't know if you saw Roots, I don't know, I mean, it's right in your face. You, you, don't, you don't see Roots no more. You don't see Roots no more. You won't see Roots no more because of that reminder of how America was. And we don't want to have, we don't want to go back and see how America was. Sometimes you can't forget it. I'm a follower. I'm sorry. Apologize. I'm sorry. Mr. Tillman, you're dancing around the issue without saying the word victimization. Can you talk to us about victimization? What do you mean? Victimized like what? I'm an educated black man. I don't feel I was victimized. What do you mean victimized like what? That the white man keep holding me down? Victimized like have I been pulled over because my Mercedes Benz got one light on and I got had 12 cops on me because I'm black? Victimized like that because it happened to me the other day. I mean, victimized. I mean, always saying victimized like um because I walk in the room, get a hold your purse, or hold yourself tight. Victimized like um, I mean, what victimization are you talking about? I mean, I mean, I'm not gonna say none of those things held me down because from this, I'm not saying victimization because. Uh, actually, I'm not asking about <clears throat> your perception of victimization. Okay. I'm asking about the, the black establishment's use of victimization. To continue in power. No, because if blacks you we can't judge black America by Al Sharpton. Because you want to say somebody portraying that blacks are victimization, look at Al Sharpton. Because um Do you remember Genesis? Six? All right. See, Genesis Six is what I call the catalyst to Barack Obama becoming president. Genesis Six was a tree down in Florida that some blacks got beat up because they sat under a tree. Now, you don't remember it because Al Sharpton went down there and, and it got quiet. But there were some blacks that were victimized and they wanted justice and everybody, blacks all around America marched on it. It was real big. But because of, like I said, Al Sharpton, he comes to the picture and everybody said, oh, go, everybody the victim. We've been in power, we've been in power. What happened? We've been in power, we've been in power. Hold on. But, Sorry about that. TV victimization sells advertisement. It sells dollars. This Donald Sterling thing, again, that's dollars. To me, what I heard was a man embarrassed because this woman was messing around with another man and all his friends was laughing at him. See, that's what I heard. Now, CNN can say it's racism, there's victims. Magic ain't a victim. The lady ain't a victim. CNN makes money off the perception of victimization or quote-unquote white guilt. There's no blacks on your TV saying, look what y'all done to me. There's no blacks on TV saying, let's go get Zimmerman. Stop Zimmerman right now. There's no blacks chasing Zimmerman down. And all the atrocities that have happened, all the, all the big media um, fiascos that happened to African Americans, you forgot about it because you're not even perpetrating them as being victimization. But Donald Sterling, he's a victim right now. Clyde Bundy, he was a victim. See, there are victims of it. The people who are saying, I'm not a racist, stop, hold on, stop this for me now. But there's no black screaming, um, 
You're holding me down. Why are you stopping this in? You're not bringing up resources to my neighborhood. Can I have equal opportunity on jobs? Can you bring this show to my tax dollars here? Can you bring, you're hearing that now. You're not hearing no one saying that um, it's because of the white man I ain't got no job no more. He's saying the white man ain't bringing no job to my neighborhood. He's saying he's not bringing no resources. You're hearing that. What you're hearing in victimization is I can't say nigger like Django Unchained says. Why are you jumping on me? Why are they saying I'm this? Why are they saying I'm that? There is no, there is no black. Since George Bush, you ain't heard no black. You haven't, since George Bush, you ain't heard no black scream. Wowzy, wowzy, wowzy. Renata, I would like. Thank you. I would like to, to invite you to think beyond your skin and do not look into the this mirror. This is not a question. And do not look into the mirror uh, and say, oh, look at this. I'm whatever. Uh, right. Question. Uh, question. States, What's the question? We do not look at each other. I'm sorry, Renata, if you don't have a question, I'm going color. to call the next and question. Would you be able, or would, the, would, would black people be able to rise above and stop considering themselves as a race? <laughs> We do not consider ourselves as a race. I never look in the mirror and say, oh, look That's at this, nice. I'm this. That's very nice. And would, but you would haven't the come black away people, please, they, you whoever know. considers himself black, be able to look in the mirror and not see a color? And yes, no. There's no women here. Yes. And that you are equal. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, I can. Okay, do it. Yes. Listen, I, I'm going to do it. 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 Loud, please. Next question. Loud, please. I, you know, I think it would be very helpful for all of us if whoever is asking a question would stand up and deliver the question so everybody can hear it. Right. Why am I the only one who has to stand up? I'm the black woman. Because you're black, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm the only reason. Black woman. That's another woman. Black woman. Yes. Black, that's the only reason. Good evening, everyone. How are you? I'm quite capable of standing up and speaking. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Tillman is a friend of mine, and this is father, Mr. Tillman number one. I'm so happy to see him both. I haven't seen him in quite a long time. And I thank you for letting us all be here. And Charles, thank you very, very much for opening the door. My question thank you, is, Charles. though, I'm going to get to my question. My question is, though, in the last election, I was out getting petition signed. There is a question on the table about term limits. And since you possibly going to be a new congressman, I want to know your position on that. In the last election, and I'm not sure about the numbers, Mr. Chairman, there were 175 uncontested seats in Illinois. Could you tell me your position on term limits in Illinois, which has no term limits at all on elected officials? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sonia Perdue. South Street Journal, we have an event June 7th, I'll say that for, for the paper, and she's pushing term limits, and she know, I believe term limits is your ballot, your vote. Um, and this is why I feel this way. I might be different than other um, people, views, but again, I hate to bring it back to the African American community, but in, um, in the black community, we um, tend to elect our officials and get rid of our officials. You know, term limits is by the ballot. And I feel that if you take away my right to choose my leader, if I like my leader, that's almost like um, voter disenfranchisement. Because if I elect this guy to get this, this guy right here to get this work done for me, and it took him one term to learn where the bathroom's at, and just on the second term he finally got the issue done, his time is up. Now I'd start all over from the beginning on that same issue that I got. Then I'm going around in a circle, then I have lost. 
Now, in my ideology, big corporations who have their big agenda, they will in turn be able to pick those people because they will have a cycle of candidates already lined up that they're going to back after that time leaves out. The people, if the people are stripped from their power to elect, then a lot of people, democracy is going unchecked because I feel that every American should have a right to choose their representative from their area. And if that representative is doing a good job for them, then they should stay. Now, if everybody feels dissatisfied with Michael Madigan, like most people do, then a lot of people should move in Michael Madigan's district and not elect Michael Madigan. You know, people like their politicians. They get elected in their area because those people like their politicians. If outside people in that area feel differently, that's the outside because that politician might be affecting their laws citywide, but as far as service day to day, hand to hand, each citizen want to feel that they know their politician and know that person that they elected and know that this my guy is going to get something done for me and not be gone in just one term. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right, Judy. Currently introducing the U.S. Senate is a 20 week abortion ban. How would you vote if you were a member of the House once it came to the House? You said a 20 week abortion ban. You said, that how would I vote on a 20 week abortion ban? Yes. So, how would so you be saying that? <laughs> will I support a ban on five, a, 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 a lady five months pregnant? Yes. Yes. Because I believe, I believe in um, life. And I believe all uh, life. Father, what about in cases where she has an illness or a medical condition where abortion is indicated as a only way if, to resolve it? If, I don't believe that there should be no law. Me being a Republican, I believe that each individual has a right to do what they want to do. And if a female wants to have an abortion, I don't believe government should tell her that she shouldn't. I believe government should not give her the money to because I believe that's her choice. Now, if her physician feels that that's between her and her physician and her creator, I don't believe that government money should be aiding in, I, I don't believe in the death penalty and I don't believe in abortion. I believe they're one and the same. And I see five months is almost life because you can have, I've seen premature babies born in five months, six months, you know, and, but that's just my belief. But I don't believe government should impose a will on any woman or any man or anybody on what, I don't believe in seatbelts, you know, so I believe I want to hurt myself, that's, just, that's my opinion, that's my life, but I don't believe that government should force anyone to do something that they do not want to do or anyone to prevent anybody from doing something that they shouldn't do if it's between them, themselves, and they got. I don't believe in government should give you the money for that. That's just not how it is. He has a no. follow up Ron back here. Yes. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, he's had some questions. No, he Okay, I hope you'll forgive me, Brown, for not rising because it's not so easy for me that year. Well, okay. All right. All right. Um, uh, Ms. Mr. Tellman. Yes, sir. Uh, what, uh, given given the fact that Barack Obama could not um, could not beat Bobby Rush out of his congressional seat, what what do, would you estimate your chances are of doing it? That's a good question, <laughs> right? Um, there's an author by the name of Miyamoto Musashi, right? He wrote this book called The Book of the Five Rings. Now, it's a book of strategy. Now, in this book, he says, all warriors advance during the moment of timing. In timing, there's everything. It's my time. Um, I'm not going to speak on this the cloud of indictment that's hovering over him. I'm not gonna speak on his ill health. 
what I'm going to speak on is that the community in the first congressional district know the Tillman family. Now, what well, people don't know me, I'm a Tillman. You know, we, we're one of the baddest black political families on the south side of Chicago, you know, that's for the record. And um, Democrats, they were Democrats, you know, I'm the first generation Republican kind for the record, I'm just saying, you know, but we, we, we run the south side. When I mean run the south side, I mean that black Chicago know that they get services. Black Chicago, black south side Chicago know that they get their fair share contract and they'll get somebody that will um, speak for them and that it, they know this, that at least they will get somebody that will inform them of the issues that are being voted upon because what's going on in, I don't know about how, in their house district, but most likely in the south side, most of our congressmen and politicians do not come back and inform the constituents of the votes that they're voting on. But at least that I will be able to inform them on was it okay to shoot Gaddafi or not? Is it okay to use drones in Yemen or not? Should we put boots on the ground in Nigeria or not? Is it okay to back the rebels in Egypt or not? Should we have a right to work state here or not? These are questions that I can at least tell my constituents, well, I feel this way, or well, I feel that way. At least they will be informed, whether they like my vote or not, of the issues that are being placed out there. Because, in my opinion, it's lack of information that is causing all the suffering and strife politically here in Illinois. And most politicians don't come home and inform. Here are state reps, state senators, you know, no one, the councilmen, they pass the votes, but they never explain to you why they pass that vote. And so me being a Republican in an all democratic area, I have more desire to do the right by the people because me being a Democrat, I mean Republican in a Democratic spot, knowing that they can take me out in a All heartbeat. Right. So I'd be more prone to All right, we have only a few minutes more of the uh, question and answer period. Uh, the uh, questions and the answers should be short because we want to have a yeah. rebuttal period. All right. Uh, Cubs or Sox fan? <laughs> you have, Andy has not had a, a question yet. I have a question specifically. Uh, is it your impression that the Republican Party, because you're running as a Republican, do you think the Republicans did a much better job during George Bush's eight years than the Democrats would have done? Do you think the Republican Party today cares about middle class and poor people? Well, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go here, John. I think blacks did good under George Bush, given the economy and um, the boom that there was there in the real estate housing. They did good, period. In the books, does not um, show that. Right now, the economy is bad, the blacks are suffering, and they're being ignored. And I believe the Democratic Party is just using Barack Obama as an image to quiet African Americans. But if, he, if Barack Obama was a Republican, or if Barack Obama was white right now. The things that are happening, that Dem that, that even a Democrat, if Barack Obama was white right now, the, um, the country would be in an uproar because of um, the lack of representation and the resources that are flowing down this way. At least you got a stimulus check every time you do taxes than George Bush. At least you put money in your pocket every five minutes. At least you can say that. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, James, regarding your political affiliation here. Thank you, Charles. Now, in the last election, Democratic Party nominated and spent an awful lot of money electing the black man as president. And the Republican Party had a guy who were running for president. He made a remark that 47% of the people weren't worth thinking about. And I think that included a lot of people. Now, I gotta wonder why you would over one guy over another. Well, just like... he was talking about when he said no part of No, um... Um... Again... I did vote for Barack Obama for the record. I said that earlier. But let me go for the... 
the question of Mitt Romney, like a lot of Republicans who voted, who didn't vote, who didn't vote at all. A lot of Republicans stayed home. A lot of Republicans felt that he was not. <coughs> a lot. I mean, if you look at the numbers during John McCain, John McCain had won the popular vote. Barack Obama won the electoral. This time, if, if everybody stayed, if the same John McCain voters for the state came out, it was a different ball game. The numbers show that they stayed home. So it was just not, a lot of Republicans felt that, well, I don't, I'm not feeling this guy neither. Or they was mad because he dropped the ball on Benghazi, and they feel like, I'm not messing with you no more. Right. Yeah, yeah um, just a follow-up on reparations. Yes, were, there, were there reparations uh, attempts in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s? Do you know about that? Well... Yes, they were until I think Andrew Jackson comes in the building, and um, the, yeah, we want to go, we want to go to which Andrew Jackson? The president. That was 1820. <laughs> what I'm trying to go, <coughs> you, you saying what? We never oh. get reparations. You, I was going from the you want to oh. know where the derailment. Happened. I thought oh. you wouldn't know what happened. Oh, all right. Because it never oh. happened. It so never happened. Reparations, you started. It never happened. People started trying to get. It never happened. 1820. It 18 never happened. Right. It was something that, the 40, called the 40 Acres and a Mule program that Abraham Lincoln was trying to inform. Was, that's where the reparation <laughs> situation comes from. The 40 Acres and a Mule right, to give right, the slaves right. that, and then President, after going to President Jackson, got rid of Freeman Board and Bureau and, and so Johnson, Johnson, excuse me. Andrew Johnson, right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, Thank you very kind. You're Thank you very kindly for this minute from Atlanta Lincoln. I apologize for that. <laughs> Senior moment. Senior moment. <laughs> okay. Um, we are now coming to our sometimes characterized as infamous rebuttal period. Would you like more uh, hot water? You have oh, I would love some. Yes, sir. Well, I the rest listen. of the world. Yes. Yeah, yeah I know. It's all right. Now. Please. Uh, water. Cheap checks. How many people have remarks to make to the rest of us uh, to enlighten us all? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, oh, Rob, 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 over here. Yes, honey, thank you. Uh, Rob, Rob. Rob. And, all right. Um, we'll, we'll make it five minutes because I think uh, a lot of people will be short. Yes. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, don't make it Our speaker, of course, gets the last word. Thank you. Uh, final rebuttal of the night. And uh, that'd be great. And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that you'll be good to our waitresses. And uh, yes. uh, I hope to see you after that. And uh, another encounter. Uh, you can collect the. Uh, the schedule uh, over there, and we have it already on that uh, little table with the flowers. Okay. Uh, All right, let's thank you. Thank you very much. You don't know how nervous I was up here, you know. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Racing yeah. goes a long way. I'm speaking in front of a bunch of white folks that so are hang me in the back. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> let's go, Jesus. Yeah. Let's yeah. be nice. Yeah. 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 I'm taking the first rebuttal tonight, and I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. I am a racist. I don't judge people by the color of their skin. I judge them by the content of their character. As Martin Luther King said, a scammer is still a scammer in any language. A user is still a user in any language. A giver is still a giver. A charitable person is still a charitable person. You know, one of the things that really kind of gets me upset about this whole thing is when somebody hides behind a race card and uses their skin color as an advantage or disadvantage. When really what we should be looking at is we should judge people on who they are and the content of their character and not the color of their skin. I really will want to say, yes, I'm a racist. 
a user is still a user. And I discriminate against users. A crook is still a crook. And I discriminate against crooks. So in that case, if you want to call me a user by judging people by the content of their character, you betcha I'm a user and you betcha I'm a racist. And I'll be proud of it. Now, if you're asking me, am I judging people by the color of their skin? Absolutely not. Thank you. Butter. Where are they? Where, where, who wants to be first? That was the first street butter. That was the first street butter. Racist. If you want to say anything. Yeah, yeah, probably. Right here, right there. Go ahead. Say something. Oh, I don't right. necessarily rebuttal. You want to give them the first rebuttal? No. Come on up and say something. I want to say something. Go up and say it. I don't say anything. I can't. No, you can say anything you want. You got five minutes. Come on up. We have a rule here. Get behind the mic. One at a time is helpful. <laughs> All right, David. Followed by John. Thank you. I'm David Travis. Good evening. Uh, I took a few notes, and uh, I'd like to begin by saying one: I don't like Barack Obama. In fact. I detest Barack Obama, not because he's a Democrat and not because he's a black. Indeed, Barack Obama is not the first black that has been elected president in America because he's only half black. So that doesn't really count. Uh, can I please be allowed? Do you, do you want to come up here and talk? Thank you. Then please afford me my right to talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, as I was saying, uh, Barack Obama is not in fact black. He's only half black. Uh, the fact is that Barack Obama is, everything he does is in the direction of socialism. Uh, it seems to be... It seems that he's pulling the country down every day with everything he does. Once again, Charlie, will you please respect my right to stand here and say what I want to say, or would you rather take my place? I didn't hear what you said. Do you want to repeat that? Is that an offer? Take your place? I think you should just shut your mouth and let me talk. That's what I think. Okay? I think you do this every chance you get. It's supposed to be one fool at a time, and you always make a horse's ass out of yourself. Ooh, no personal attacks, David. Yeah, calm down. Well, that's not a personal attack. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Hell, you say. As I was saying. I don't care what the race or the color or the sex is of the person in office. What I care about is their politics. And I have not seen any decent politics coming from Barack Obama. Uh, I've seen, and he's, he's been caught in several lies. He's, he's just not a good man for the office, whatever his color is. I care what the politics is of the individual. Uh, most important, I believe the most important color is gold, silver, and green, and in that order. Money. Good night. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is John Frigo, and I'm uh, pleasantly, uh, I was uh, invited here by uh, uh, another person. This is my first time here. I want to compliment you on uh, having uh, what looks like true democracy and freedom of expression of your opinions. 
Uh, I think uh, in the history of the United States, there's not uh, a lot of uh, agreement on certain tough issues that we all face. But uh, the reason I wanted to talk, I was told that I don't have to, to uh, rebut the uh, speaker. Uh, and I, I choose to let his words uh, stand. But I wanted to ask you, because you're thinkers, I want to ask you to consider uh, a vote for Bruce Rauner in the uh, November gubernatorial election. I'm, I, I'm a recently retired uh, small businessman who's been in Northern Illinois for my whole career. And uh, I've just been an <clears throat> unpaid volunteer for him. I've met him. I was fortunate enough to have lunch with him in a group of about 20 people and I could ask him some uh, three or four questions. And you may say, no, I don't want to do that. And here's, well, here's uh, you know, I don't need to remind you of a few things. Number one, that due to Democrats and Republicans, the state of Illinois is in the worst financial shape of any state in the union. That said, I think just as a matter of logic, and I think you folks are logical, uh, I, I think you ought to consider I'm not telling you who to vote for. I think you ought to consider a change and a vote for Bruce Rauner. Now, he, he 30 years ago, he started a company. It grew and became one of the biggest and best of any company in Illinois. He's from Illinois. Uh, he likes uh, term limits. He pushed hard for that. Hopefully, they'll get on the ballot. He has enough signatures. He's given millions of dollars to the city of Chicago schools charter schools as an alternative for some poor performing schools for some uh, Chicago citizens and citizens of the lesser means to try to have better schooling for their kids. And uh, I just think he has a lot of skills in the financial world and in the business world that we need in uh, our governor. Now, so you can buy your way into the office. There you go. One fool at a time, uh, man. Well, the way it's set, you know, whether you like it or not, the way it's set up is if he, uh, through hard work, amassed a lot of money and has friends who have given him money, uh, that's what happens. Now, if you don't think that Quinn has a lot of rich friends that are pouring tons of money, including different types of unions, then, then he's getting millions, too. Whether that's fair or not, I don't think necessarily a, a, a gov government union should be able to take our tax dollars and give it back to, to somebody running for office. But anyhow, all I'm saying is, I know there's a lot, it could be a lot of different opinions, but I, I've seen this fellow close up. It's the only campaign I ever worked for. I'm a moderate to independent, a moderate Republican to independent person. I don't believe in voting straight ticket for, any, for either the Democrats or Republicans. this was a Republican. Whoa, 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 democracy, as I said, in action. <laughs> Thank you for having the courage to come here, uh, Jimmy. And uh, anyhow, consider, if you will, if you don't have to, but I'm just suggesting it, maybe you'll consider it. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not. Well, it's Andy gets up. Hey, Andy, what's up? Andy gets up. <laughs> First of all, for the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with the college, um, anybody during rebuttal period can get up here and say anything they damn well please. Uh, we've had people talk about, we've had presenters come up here and talk about their topic, and then some guy talks, gets up here and, talk, and talks about and starts denouncing the drug companies. <laughs> yeah, some of you know who I'm talking about. Um, in any case, First of all, I want to thank 
Mr. Tillman for coming out to speak here. In this audience, that's his position is kind of like Daniel in a lion's den. <laughs> Having said that, however, some of my relatives are among live in Hyde Park and are among the people who he is seeking to represent. And I can tell you now that they're planning to vote to reelect Bobby Rush for another term. Wow. Very simple. Number one, they are unpersuaded by some of his arguments that a change is necessary. Given the track record of the Republican Party across the nation, that it has moved way too far to the right at a time when it has, uh, when, Bar when they denounced Barry Goldwater for being a liberal, at a, at a time when they pay lip service to President Reagan, but in fact privately denounce him as being too liberal too, uh-uh. They're not voting for any Republicans for public office. That's number one. Uh, number two, with regard to the gentleman a few moments ago who stood up here and was busy singing Bruce Rauner's praises. First of all, Bruce, I'm not an admirer of Patrick Quinn, but I'm going to vote for his re-election because I've got nowhere else to go. Bruce Rauner is simply the same kind of conservative retread that the Republican Party has been throwing out for years. The same emphasis on term limits. We already have a system of term limits. They're called elections. And Mr. Tillman, in fairness to you, you said pretty much the same thing a few minutes ago. Uh, number two, if the Republican Party wants to field somebody who can get Democratic votes, including mine, they need to nominate people who are Republicans in the same way that Dick Ogilvy and Chuck Percy were. Those are the only kind of Republicans that many of us Democrats would even consider supporting. Bruce Rauner has a record of, has, a, has been accused of being very obnoxious. How does he think he's going to get along with a Democratic legislature? Because I've got news for these people. The Republicans are, not, are still going to be a minority in Springfield in the fall. That's number one. Um, number two, I am a retired Cook County employee. Now, our pension has not uh, up to now been an issue. But I'm tired of, of having the public employee unions, as has been the case with Scott Walker in Wisconsin. I'm tired of them always being a whipping boy and being held up to blame for the problems of the state, which are shared by all. I'm sorry. I'm not going to vote for another clone of Scott Walker. Why, rumor has it that the next thing that's going to happen in Wisconsin is that he's already going to open the concentration camps uh, for his opponents. No, thank you. I'm not for I'm not for Scott Walker or any Scott Walker clone like Bruce Rauner. Thank you. Will there be jobs in those concentration camps? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, Charlie, I would like to respectfully uh, remind you of the uh, one fool at a time rule. Uh, wow. Now, um, all right, all right. Now, um, now, I was real interested in coming to this presentation tonight because uh, it just so happens I, I didn't mention this in my, when I asked my question, but I actually do live in Bobby Rush's congressional district, and so I was interested in hearing what what this gentleman had to say. It's unfortunate that I, I missed the speech, um, but I did get to I did catch part of the question and answer session. Um, so I, I didn't really learn a whole lot about uh, the congressman. I do, as I, my question implied, I do, given the fact that the uh, congressional district is overwhelmingly Democratic, I think that, um, that Mr. Tillman's chances of getting elected are not good. Now, I, I would like to respond to uh, what Dave Travis said about President Obama. Uh, he said that President Obama is not black, he's half black. Well, now, you know, you know, this is this would uh, this would be a good subject to bring up at the at the next hair splitters convention because um, because you get if you look at different cultures, the idea of who's black and who's white is the the, the definition varies from from <coughs> one country to another, and it also varies over time. Like for example, in South Africa, yeah, if if Barack Obama had grown up in South Africa, he would not be considered black because they consider anybody to be a mixed race. Uh, to be in a different category, which they call colored. Now, if Obama had lived in Sudan, if he'd grown up in that country, um, he would also not be considered black. He would be considered white. 
because because his mom was white and 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 if you're if you're at least partly of non-African ancestry uh, according to the Sudanese definition of race you're you're a white person uh, however uh, Obama uh, in spite of what the birthers might think Obama was uh, was born here in the United States and here in the US the traditional definition has been the so-called one drop rule where anybody who's even partly black is thought to be black uh, now the fact of the matter is that most African Americans are at least part white because, and, and if you want to know the reason why, I would suggest you go see the movie 12 Years a Slave. Um, and, uh, and, and, and now what's, what's less well known is that a lot of white people, especially those whose ancestors have lived here before 1800, are also part black, uh, although many of them may not know it, because a certain number of black people, uh, you know, if they had children that were, let's say, half black, half white, and then they had another child that was, let's say, th three quarters black and one quarter white, uh, or, or three quarters white and one quarter black, eventually, eventually, some would be light enough to, to, to look, to pass for Caucasian, and at that point, they might move away, move to another part of the country, uh, and they would, they would pass for white, put down that they're white on the, on, on, on the, on the forms, and uh, marry a white person, and raise their children as white. And, and so there may actually be white people right here in this restaurant who are right part now. black and don't even realize it yet. That's right. Tell it. All right. Uh, that's all I have to say about that. Yay. And that's, there's a clear microphone. We need rebutters. What? No, no. Oh, I think I'm probably one hundred and twenty-eighth uh, part American Indian, <laughs> but uh, because the, they were the Bassfords were uh, early settlers in New Amsterdam, otherwise known as New York, and uh, as a displaced New Yorker, uh, uh, now sometimes Chicagoan, uh, I. Uh, I remember a few years ago when uh, the uh, Republican U.S. Senate candidate was, uh, was black. Uh, he was imported, I think, from Maryland. Uh, he didn't do very well uh, in the election, uh, mainly because I think uh, he was uh, uh, an ideologue uh, 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 right to lifer. Alan uh, Keyes. Uh, Donald Alan Keyes, Keyes, right. Alan, Alan, Alan. Alan Keyes, right. Uh, I remember uh, my wife happens to be a Republican god. A lesser in favor. Uh, uh, she's 90 years old and uh, <laughs> should be forgiven some things, you know. Uh, we hope, uh, you know, the reason she became a Republican was that uh, after a lifelong, she's Puerto Rican, and uh, uh, when, uh, who was it, uh, Carter, uh, uh, President Carter uh, made an arrangement with the Panamanians that when they took back the that they would take back the uh, charge of the canal zone a little sooner than the 99 years uh, that uh, uh, had been in the treaty. Uh, so uh, Puerto Ricans were upset. Uh, was the United States going to trade off Puerto Rico or something? Uh, uh, she, uh, she, she felt threatened, I think. Uh, but, you know, she was also exposed to a lot of management propaganda. Uh, she was taking, she worked for the U.S. Postal Service, and, and at any rate, she became a convert to the Republican Party, and she got medals from, she wrote them letters, and got uh, congressional medals, uh, uh, Republican senatorial inner circle medals of freedom. In fact, uh, she is, got three such medals. Uh, the uh, basic principles of these
capitalist parties, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, and perhaps the Greens too, is to seek and hold office. That's their basic principle. If you can get and hold on to an office, that's what you do, what you say, what you think, and what you work for. And that's, you know, today, uh, almost exclusively up to the best bidder. Uh, and uh, since uh, uh, Bruce Rauner had more money than uh, any of the other Republican candidates, uh, he, he uh, won their nomination. Uh, also, he became, became vociferously anti-labor, and that recruits money uh, for the Republican candidates, too. Well, but I don't know about uh, Jimmy Lee Hillman, uh, the second uh, uh, prospects, or his, uh, uh, <laughs> or whether, to what extent he has any uh, commitments or program or anything else, and I'm sorry that I didn't learn much about that tonight. Butter. I'm Michael Foley. I want to thank you, Mr. Tillman, for coming here to speak to us tonight. <coughs> You're thoughtful, intelligent, reasonable, and well-spoken. That ain't going to get you on TV. <laughs> the temper of the times these days are any black guy running for anything got to scream racism 24 hours a day or TV will ignore him. Anyway, the only other thing I want to say is about Bruce Rauner. There's only one thing to say about Bruce Rauner. Bruce Rauner makes $53 million a year. And Bruce Rauner says people making $17,000 a year are making too much money and they should have their pay chopped $2,000 a year down to $15,000 a year. What? what? Bruce what? Rauner what? has been, it's been reported in the mainstream media, widely reported in the mainstream media, Bruce Rauner makes $53 million a year, and he has said that people making $17,000 a year are making too much money, and they should have their pay chopped to $15,000 a year. And he said that until somebody told him, shut up, or the media will crucify you. And then he changed his tune and started singing a different song. But Bruce Rauner has said it. People making $17,000 a year more or less, which is the minimum wage in Illinois, are making too much money, they should have their pay chopped to the national minimum wage, which is $7 and something, which is about 15000 a year. Bruce Rauner had said it, he said it when he meant it, he said it when he didn't realize people were going to start publicizing it, and when it was publicized, he figured he better change his tune because his campaign advisors told him to. Bruce Rauner never said People making 15, 53 million dollars a year should have their pay chopped to 15 thousand dollars a year. Bruce Rauner makes 53 million a year, and he says people making 17 thousand dollars a year make too much money. They should have their pay chopped to 15 thousand dollars a year. Bruce Rauner said it. It was widely reported in the mainstream media, and he said it before people realized what he was saying. Before he realized how stupid he sounded, before he realized how politically toxic it would be when his wife told him to shut up and change his tune, he shut up and he changed his tune. But Bruce Rauner said it and he meant it. People making 17000 a year make too much money and Bruce Rauner wants their pay chop to 15000 a year. That's all I got. Thank you. I said, keep repeating it. We'll believe it eventually. Hi. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Even though you didn't think you were going to have any constituents, you got at least at least one or two. So that just happened. People come from all over to this joint. Um, and even though I'm uh, a Democrat, a pretty progressive Democrat, I, I, I wish you some luck because uh, I've got to take issue uh, uh, with David on this. Uh, I'm a believer in term limits. 
the Democrats are never going to bring it up. The party in power is not going to bring it up because they want to keep their power. They don't want to have to go to the trouble of, uh, of convincing the voters of something new from time to time. And that's why the party that's out of power, in this case the Republicans, with whom I disagree and for whom I will probably never vote, certainly not for Rauner, uh, they take up the cause of term limits, but uh, elections are not term limits. Elections are elections which are largely controlled by the incumbents and their money and their power and their name recognition. Uh, but so, so in that sense, I, I, I wish you luck. I think you're certainly going to need a lot of it against uh, uh, Bobby Rush. But uh, there's some specific questions that maybe when you come up for your final rebuttal you could address. Uh, in Washington, how would you how would you deal with income tax? Do you believe that the income tax that we have now, which is somewhat progressive, is enough? Do you think it should be more progressive? Should we, should we have higher brackets, which a lot of people are talking about for higher income people, or how, how would you handle that? Uh, in general, the issue, the people here that know me know my big issue is, is the problem of inequality of income and wealth. Uh, in this country, and it's getting worse all the time. And how would you, if not with taxes, uh, how would you deal with that? And we we had a speaker within the last year and a half who talked about the possibility of having uh, a one-time net worth tax to redistribute income. And uh, let's see if you want to comment uh, on that. Okay. Uh, military spending is another issue which uh, Republicans differ typically from Democrats on. And another issue that's a, it's now a state issue, if you comment on the concealed carry issue. Uh, uh, here in Illinois, people are fighting a tooth and nail. Theoretically, we have a concealed carry law, but it's really, really uh, a law that uh, uh, masquerades as a concealed carry law. It's really an anti-concealed carry law. And uh, yes, I know, it, it makes a rough uh, you know, for those of us, for like, like, like your loony neighbor, he's still, you know, he, he can't do everything he wants to do. Okay. Anyway, Charlie's got a loony neighbor who does have a gun. So anyway, uh, and my other question is, should some of these laws be federal anyway? Now at least it's state. It used to be every community, you know, if you did have, uh, let's say, a hunting rifle in your trunk, if you happen to drive through the wrong community you could and get stopped, you could get arrested. Now, should these laws be, some of these laws be federal? Okay, and that's, a, that's all I can think of. I'm sure I'll think of some more when I sit down, but if you can address those issues. Thanks. My name is Renata Stowasa. I came to this country from Austria in 1958 um, to Kentucky. And I went to school, and at that time, as everybody knows, uh, segregation was the law. Uh, I remember one color people live on one side of the railroad track and the others on the other. But you, uh, you know more about that than I'm, I do, I'm sure. Um, then I lived in North Carolina, and I have worked since I have been in this country in medical centers at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Then at, I, we came to and then at the medical college in Charleston, South Carolina, Nota Bene. Uh, when we arrived there, I was married, and when we arrived there, we were. Uh, welcomed by the welcoming committee and the first place they took me to was the slave market and this was the proud place to take a newcomer to that they had traded slaves and I had an opinion about that but never mind uh, then we I came to Chicago make a long story short I have worked in this country for 28 years paid taxes all the time. Then uh, the German consulate needed someone who knew German as well as was familiar with um, medical administrative procedure to, uh, to work with the survivors of the Holocaust. 
for, if for restitution benefits. And I worked for the German consulate for 18 years and paid taxes to Germany. I have always paid taxes in Germany and in Austria and in the United States. At age 72, I was called to the Social Security Administration here in Chicago and I was told, oh, they just realized that I have paid uh, German Social Security as well and that now because of that Social Security has overpaid me $18,000 and that that has to be repaid. Um, and that there is a law that Ro President Reagan Republican president went to the wall of Berlin and challenged Gorbachev to tear down this wall of all the things that were important or not important to do at that time. He signed a law with the Germans that who works for both countries is not equal to, is not eligible to equal Social Security benefits. And at age 72, I was told that I had to pay, repay $18,000 to Social Security, and which is easy, they simply withhold it. And I was told that uh, uh, if you don't have, that I now qualify for food stamps. This is the Republican this is your Republican agenda. <laughs> Whatever they tell you, be aware of it. We have five minutes, Tim. Yes, Andy. Really? <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank our speaker, Mr. Tillman. It's an amazing, amazing show of courage to come here in this kind of a den and, and risk the kind of comments that you may get from this forum of uh, free thinkers that are uh, sometimes at opposite ends of the spectrum. But um, in my comments uh, re kind of revolve around what I view as the Republican Party over the last 14 years or so. But starting with uh, the year 2000, when uh, the Supreme Court installed, installed George and Dick, how many people here are aware that George and Dick were never elected? Do, do, do a lot of people understand that George was never the president and Dick Cheney was never the vice president? They were two corporate criminals that were installed to masquerade as president and vice president in the Republican Party after they lost both elections. They lost it in a close one in 2000 and they lost it in a landslide in 2004. And then the Republican criminals who had been put in high places in the states with voting machines that were critical, they just changed the vote totals after 2 o'clock after we went to bed. It, I, many analysts called it the psychological rape of America in November of 2004. And that's what it was, psychological rape. In 2003, Jim Hightower from Texas published a book called... The book was called Thieves in High Places. And he listed, he, after three years, two years of looking at the Bush administration, the Republicans had total control. He, he had seven pages of bills, a list of about 200 bills, and he said, put on your gas mask and your rubber gloves and your rubber boots and wade into this toxic sludge. See if you can find one bill in there that isn't the opposite of the teachings of Christ or the opposite of the golden rule. See if you find anything in there that would help the American people and not just shovel money to billionaires. And he said, after you look at this toxic sludge, this is just the first two years, we had eight years of it. He says, ask yourself this question. Why do you think there are so many uh, sexual scandals in the Republican Party? Not the Democrat, 
the re Democratic, the Republican Party. Well, he said, the reason that we have so many sexual scandals in the Republican Party is that to pass this kind of legislation, to pass these bills, you need perverts. You need people with no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. You need people that will uh, you know, see nothing wrong with having sex with a 10 or 11 year old boy or girl. And the Franklin, a book called The Franklin Scandal spells that out. Uh, the Republican Party has been involved in, uh, you know, uh, sexual scandals of all kinds, going back into the mid 80s with a savings and loan scandal. The second thing, many of us, uh, I, I don't get the sense that Mr. Tillman knows that from 2000 to 2008, well, it was the eight, darkest eight years of my life, living under the massive corporate criminal enterprise that was, they had taken over the top levels of our government. We had criminals masquerading as Republicans for eight solid years. Many of those people should be serving long jail terms, but they're not. They're out there. Condoleezza Rice is widely recognized in foreign countries to be a war criminal. It should be prosecuted. She was recently offered $35,000 for a speech at, uh, was it Fordham? Rutgers. It was Rutgers. And the students and people rose up and said, hell no, we're not having her here. She's a war criminal. Um, but the major media didn't see anything wrong with that initially. The Republicans, at a national level, the Republicans take a look at people in the Tea Party. To, be, to get elected as a Tea Party member, the litmus test is you have to display characteristics that can be described as in primary fundamental lack of grasp of reality, insanity on the hoof, prime beef as it were. And if you don't exhibit those strains of insanity, you are not willing to get up in front of a podium and say, ah, there's no global warming. Uh, tobacco is not a health hazard. If you're not willing to prostitute, prostitute yourself like that for massive campaign contributions, they will weed you out and put somebody else in that has a shred of ethics, morals, and a conscience. Give me just one more second. Martha Stout published a book called the sociopath next door, and she made the a comment that when you allow people that have no ethics, morals, and no conscience to get to be billionaires, to rise up to the point where they can buy and sell our politicians, if you don't regulate them, you're going to have a massive problem with the country. And today, the Republican Party, and especially the Republicans in Congress, are a wholly owned subsidiary of the billionaires from what Harvey Wasserman calls King Kong. Coal, oil, gas, and nukes, they own and operate the Senate and the Congress. And unless we're willing to deal with that, our country is in for big, big problems over the next few years. So I, I, I would, the, the thing that, uh, the question I have that hasn't been answered is, if, if you have a decent ethics and morals and a conscience, why would you run, want to run as a Republican? Why not as an independent or a Democrat? Maybe he'll answer that in his rebuttal time. Anybody want, has any questions on any of the things that I've talked about? Uh, I've brought some books tonight. Uh, see me after the talk is over. Thank you. All right. Let's thank our speaker again for putting up with you. You malcontents. I'll be eclectic as usual here. First of all, um, uh, I apologize for the space move, but they had arranged this event uh, some time ago, so we'll be back at our normal location uh, next week. I told this uh, thing many times, this story many times, but there's some new people here, so for your benefit, I'll tell it again. I am identifying myself as a yellow dog Democrat. And what does that mean? You wear yellow that, shirts? No, if I go in the vote, and the only choice is between a Republican candidate and an old yellow dog, I vote for the old yellow dog. <laughs> this is a joke, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, now regarding the rebuttals. <laughs> It brought to mind, and Bill will know him, you remember the guy, Abe from Oak Park? <laughs> no matter what the topic was, <laughs> for 10 years, solid in a row, Abe got up here 
And no matter what the topic was, he twisted it somehow into the Federal Reserve Bank and how it was destroying our nation. I mean, we could have a ballerina here and he'd say, well, ballet was ruined because of... But he did it every week. It was amazing for 10 years. So yeah, you could talk about whatever you want. I wanted to tell a new friend over there um, was bemoaning uh, federal civil service uh, or civil service employees taking the poor tax. I spent the week uh, lobbying the U.S. Congress on behalf of the federal employees. And I have a per particular fondness for the Republican Party because earlier in the fiscal year, they got this notion of shutting down the federal government. And you know what happened? A lot of you don't know the end result of that. I sat at home for, oh, I don't know how many weeks, I got paid in full for watching C-SPAN. <laughs> Not only that, but this is the real kicker. We actually legislated a pay raise as part of the legislation to come back to work. So that'll teach you. <laughs> you should have been going to take the Whitley Field. <laughs> uh, to blame the state employees or their collective bargaining organization for the financial difficulties of the state of Illinois is ridiculous at best. Uh, they put in their pension and faithfully they get the deductions and so forth. And as in the case, it's very common in the private sector that they renege on the deal. And when you see this in the public sector, you better watch out and you better not let it happen. Because if, if they do it to civil service employees, guess what they're going to do to you? Anyhow, let's see. Oh, and you like charter schools, union busting charter schools. We have a Yahoo group and I highly recommend everyone sign up for it because I'm putting out a, uh, a, an article I came across. I'm just finishing up the email. Uh, we have a group called Privatization Watch Illinois. <laughs> and it talks about, there's many examples of privatization has not quite worked the way they thought it would. The best one I like, it was matter was here. The state of Indiana privatized the Illinois toll road and leased it for 99 years to a foreign company. They, and I'm a transit guy. I discovered that they cannot build any public transit in the state of Illinois, in the state of Indiana, in the proximity of that toll road because there's a no-compete clause. And they will have to pay this company because they will lose tolls if you put in public transit. Can you believe that? Or commuter rail. So that, that, I think you got to approach this thing carefully. Let's see. Um, I think I got them. That's about it. I got them here, but I can't read it, so I guess I'll have to skip it. And you're out of time. Um, and the, you're out of time. The, the other thing I was going to say is um, the, I have a lot of occasion. I start each day by watching um, the uh, C-SPAN with the opening remarks of the House of Representatives and the Senate. And I can assure you, this thing, this rumor that came about that the Republicans were not going to let Obama have one success, one piece of legislation, I dismissed it at first. It is absolutely categorically true. Thank you. Our speaker, Jimmy Lee Hillman, uh, second candidate for Congress. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and I'd like to thank all of you all <clears throat> for accepting me. You know, I was kind of lurid and was frightened of how I will be received, and that's why I didn't come with my campaign. So let me try to answer the political questions that was asked real fast. Uh, Fifth Ward, right? Fifth Ward, right? The Fifth Ward, right? My cousins live there. Right, Fifth Ward, okay. Now, all I need 
is 40,000 Democratic votes to flip over. I don't need the whole city. Now, Bobby Bush only get about what? In, in the suburbs? I mean, Bobby Bush got about 4,000 in the suburbs. I got about 18. I should get about 90,000 Republican votes out of the suburbs. Bobby Bush is going to get about 28. To win this election, 148,000 votes, which I need. See me? I can go through ward to ward, pop 100 votes here, 300 votes there, and I get my 35,000 votes. You see, in the game of elections, it's all about numbers. You see, what I'm on is something revolutionary. Being here is revolutionary. Now, I hate that you missed my speech. And yes, I can beat Bobby Rush. You vote for Bobby Rush because he's cool. Real talk. You don't know him. You know me now. And you will vote for me because you met me. You don't know him. So you can say, well, everything everybody's saying. I'm right here. He won't be right here. Now, right to carry concealed weapons. I do believe in concealed carry. You see, I believe in safety on the south side. Now, there are guns on the south side. They're not concealed. No, they're not permits. And no citizen have the right to defend themselves. So I believe in the right to defend myself. Now, I believe in states' rights, so every state should have a right how they want to carry their weaponry. I don't believe the federal government should dictate how people should conduct their lives. 2000, when Al Gore stood up there crying because the election was not run, every member of the Black Caucus like, Al Gore, stand up. Use your constitutional rights, Senator. Cast that vote. My vote can count. What did he do? What did he do? What did he do? <laughs> All the, he didn't do nothing. He could have cast the right vote being in the Senate. It's my right. All those blacks came up there and said my vote is not being counted. Now, we want to blame all, all those Democrats for laying over? Al Gore, who father, didn't want the Democrat the people to vote for the civil rights law in the first place. We don't to go there, but all y'all remember that, correct? So the eight years of George Bush goes to Al Gore, because he had the right to say, no, I got the deciding vote. And that all those people cried, can my vote count? Can my vote count? Who saw C-SPAN? Who saw that? Who witnessed that? We forgot about that. Oh, yes, I saw that too. Rahm Emanuel, who conducted the Affordable Act Care Bill? Rahm Emanuel, is his fault why it's messed up? Is his fault why it's messed up? Now, there's not one person in here who can tell me a Republican in Chicago, Cook County, or Illinois messed them up right now. We can play D.C. all day long and pontificate all day long. Hell, we can get laid off and still get paid because Republicans looked out for us. Bam! Took care of me, did you? They took care of you, did you? They took care of you? So you can't say they didn't. That check and they off. Now, we can just look all around. Politics is local. We can sit up here and tell the world how smart we are, what we just read. All of us lay our allegiance down to the Democratic Party because it's the only game in town. You're mad at your mayor. He's a Democrat. Ain't a Republican. It's running against him. If it was a Republican running against him, y'all still vote for him, a Democrat, because that's how the game go. Every one of y'all taxes, property taxes rising up. Ain't not one Republican stuck y'all. Ain't not one Republican close y'all schools up or mess with your pension. Your pension's in trouble right now. Why? What Republican did it? Somebody tell me. We can play all these games like I'm so smart and it's all in D.C. But when it comes down to it, it's all local. Now, I don't believe in term limits because in the African American community, let me go race one time. We'll get put out the game. We just got into this game. Again, I said 1980, if you're paying attention, we opened the door for Jesse Jackson and we got it in. Matter of fact, here in Chicago, you need the black vote to even make a, make a noise now because we came out and we got it in. We're playing the game now. We're effective now. The truth of the matter here is Cook County needs the black vote to win anything. Now, we can sit here and trip on how come the blacks sitting on them and the officials down there ain't doing nothing. We can sit here and talk about how the blacks sitting on people down in City Hall, cowtowing around Emanuel or going out to Michael Madigan because Michael Madigan, Democrat, messing y'all pictures up. We ain't going to say no Republican. But it's easy to scream Scott Walker. It's easy to scream Indiana. You want jobs, right to work. We have plants in here if you want to. The South is not doing less, but we got to play the union game. You see, 
let me try to go again now. Let me see. There was, you said, also, that was eight years. Uh, you like the Republicans or not because they, they gave you money. You're going to vote for me. I'm with the right to care. The lion's there, homie. He might not be a black man, but I look in the mirror, you see a black man. You see a black man when you see Barack Obama. You might not see a half white, half Kenyan. You see a black man. We can play the game, have our feelings shown. But in the end, it's politics, it's local. Now, ain't no Republican paying me. Nah, no, they ain't backing me. They don't even like me. They probably like me. Y'all probably like me more than they like me. You know, and y'all probably don't even like me. But they like me more, y'all like me more than they do because I'm black and I'm a Republican for my people. You see, because all politics is local. And if you're black and you live in the Cook County, Chicago, you know there's only one party that's sticking it to you. If you live in Illinois, you cannot blame Scott Walker. Pat Quinn just gave $50 million out of your taxpayers' money just to get elected. Not one community that needed the money got the money. Not my neighborhood. And y'all, y'all sitting around and knowing that he did it for votes. Y'all act like it didn't happen. Whether y'all like Bruce Runner or not, let's be real. Let's be real. Y'all know y'all money is going. We can play. No, no, no. But in the end, have y'all probably like Robert Lloyd, but you talked on the phone and saying, I got it golden. But this man took your tax money out and threw it away. And y'all be like, we like this guy. We just didn't like the other guy who was talking on the telephone. I mean, we just got to be serious. Black or white, whatever. It's y'all Y'all retiring. Y'all money losing. Y'all money going out the door. And there's not one Democrat is sticking y'all up. But we can play the game. You know, we can be yellow dog Democrats. We can come down with Pat Quinn, but then four years later, oh man, I knew I should win with him, but that Bruce Runner guy, I, I don't know. You know, I've been like this. I don't know Bruce Runner. I've been trying to call Bruce Runner for a long time to get on a black radio station. He ain't, he ain't got with me. You see, so my whole goal is to get elected because my people need me. I'm on a different ball game. My people need me because of the resources that they needed and not getting it done. So my job is to sit here and tell my people what I'm at. I didn't know I would have nobody here because my speech would have been straight political. But it was all about imagery. Again, it was about image of the black man in the age of Obama. From the 12 years of slave. I wish you'd have been here. 12 years of slave, Django, the butler, and how it's a Serbian role. I mean, hold on. So now, when I leave here, that's Jim Lee Tim the second, first congressional candidate. Your next congressman. Can you vote for me, homie? Now dig it. Now, when I leave here, just think of one thing. Whether you flip Republican or go on there, close your eyes, what have you. You lost fifty million dollars four years ago. Now everybody is gonna take a fall for that. Pat Quinn might not even be around. You say, if Lisa Mack can do a job, if she do a job, he might not be Bobby Rush might not be around. Half the politicians that are out here right now might not be around. Now, we can sit here and play the game. But y'all got to make your own decisions and see what you're going to do. Send a crook back there because ah, I don't like that guy. Ah, like little kids. Or y'all going to be for real. You know, yes, yeah, democratic town. But if y'all still want what y'all want, then get what you're going to get. Because you all read the papers. You all watch CNN. Name me one Republican that's stealing y'all money right now. Call his name out. And I'll bring him here, y'all can yell at him. Call his name out. Ah, right. Mitch McConnell, yeah. Or oh, Harry Reid who said, yeah, Barack Obama ain't my president. He don't run me. You forgot about that, didn't y'all? Ooh, we heard when Barack Obama got elected. We said, ah, but we forgot about that. We can play the game. But the Democratic Party, Lily led better. Oh, he got that, didn't he? Yeah. Don't ask, don't tell. Oh, they got that, didn't they? Yeah. Dream Act is pushed to the front. Oh, this is, this is legislation that's being passed by Barack Obama now. Tell me a Republican labor law. You know? Right. No, what I'm saying though, no, you got paid. A Republican gave you some money now. Be happy. You didn't lose not a dime. Ain't that good? Ain't that all right? You didn't lose not a dime. Under Republican, I'm just saying, you got to look what politicians are doing for you because you only elect politicians to do things for you. And... Fifth Ward, Fifth Ward, you know, Jimmy Lee Tillman, I'm your next congressman, and you're going to be able to holler at me, give me dap like I met you at the college of complex, and you weren't even afraid to step on all these people that's like, you know, you know, I ain't like a black man, but I know, I hope y'all respect this black man and realize this, that he's speaking the truth to you all, ain't not one Republican in the county sticking you up, there's not one Republican in the state sticking you up, you make your choice, get stuck up, be the victim, 
And don't scream victim next time. That guy's like, I'm the victim. Because he got me. Because we don't scream victim. We like, ha, huh, I got played. It's my fault. I voted for him. All y'all know what's up. And again, my name is Jim Lee Tillman. Thank you for allowing me in the lion's den. All right.